Good evening and welcome to the Norwood Board of Selectmen meeting for Tuesday, May 23rd, 2023. Uh, this meeting is being broadcast live on Norwood Community Media as well as being taped. Uh, we would like to start the meeting with a Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Uh, we have uh, some appointments this evening and, and a couple uh, agenda items to knock off before we start that. Um, first up is uh, warrant signature update, submitting notification of reviewed and approved warrant reports signed by the board's representative. Motion to file. Motion to file made by Mr. Plasco. Second. Seconded by Mr. Sad. All those in approval? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Second, we have the meeting minutes for approval of the board, submitting meeting minutes for May 9th, 2023 Selectman's meeting. Motion to approve. Motion, ap motion approved made by Mr. Donnelly, seconded by Ms. Crow. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Great, so that brings us to our appointments. Um, these are for uh, associate members for the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, the, the Zoning Board, um, we're, we're down a few people, and the role of the associate member is to step in when uh, a full member can't, uh, for whatever reason, uh, make a meeting. And um, we've had some recent interest and some really nice uh, resumes and letters of interest, so we thought this was a good time to bring those individuals in and uh, have a conversation. And in two weeks' time, at the next selectmen's meeting, we will appoint several associate members. So uh, in no particular order, uh, we'll start with uh, Daniel uh, DiSidoro. Daniel, I'm sorry if I... Uh, Mispronounce your last That's name. Fine. Did I get it close? Yes. All right. <laughs> That's right. Then Great. You make yourself comfortable. Hey, Dan. Um, good to see you. Um, uh, welcome. And if you could introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your experience, your interest uh, in serving as an associate uh, ZBA member, and then we'll ask a few questions of you. That's it. Sure. Uh, so I'm Dan Desidoro. Uh, I'm relatively new to Norwood. I've been here about 18 months. I'm originally from Braintree, um, and prior to moving to Norwood, I had been spent, I spent 11 years in Washington, D.C. Before that, it was four years in Georgia, I was in the Army. Um, I'm a licensed attorney in Massachusetts, um, worked for the federal government after getting out of the Army, uh, mostly doing employment law, doing a lot of administrative hearings, defending I work for two different agencies, um, so I defend the agencies in employment discrimination cases or defend them in like a, basically a civil service appeal if you were to take a disciplinary action against an employee. Um, and then I got an opportunity, my wife and I are both from the Massachusetts area, got an opportunity to come back to Massachusetts, found a home in Norwood, and we've been enjoying our time here. And, was interested in trying to be of service and you know join join the community and help out in any way I could. So that's what prompted me to submit my resume for for this. Great, thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Um, we'll open it up to questions uh, from the board. Ms. Grove. Sure. Um, welcome. Thanks for coming to see us tonight. Thank you. Uh, I guess the question I would have is: tell us a little bit about. Uh, from your experiences, what do you hope that you can bring to the, the board in terms of, uh, you know, perspectives or, or uh, ability to advise uh, that you think is unique to you? Sure. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of the experience I got in the administrative hearing settings in, you know, my employment law days, you know, one of the benefits I think we... <laughs> You know, I experienced in that was trying to find a resolution um, before a decision had to be made by, you know, either the arbitrator or an administrative judge. And so I think that's one of the benefits, you know, that I could bring to it is to try to look for, is there some sort of common ground if there's a dispute as to whether or not, a, how a, you know, an 
action should be handled, if, if there's a dispute, see if there's a room for common ground. Um, and if there is, maybe explore that so that you know, maybe as many parties are as happy as they can be um, by a final decision as opposed to you know, just imposing a decision upon somebody. Thank you. Yeah. Great. On, yes. on your um, talent bank application, I think you te checked off nine different things. So what makes you, inter well, I guess you said why you're interested in the zoning board, but yeah. since you've only been here 18 months, did you say? Yes. And you checked off the airport commission? Yes. And before you learn any more, make a motion to appoint to the airport. <laughs> 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 uh, Again, yeah, it was just, uh, you know, new to town, but interested in getting involved and seeing, you know, what opportunities existed that, you know, I, I could be of service. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Being for Mr. Donnelly. Good evening. Thank you for, for applying. So. Um, as you looked at those different committees that you listed in your talent bank, had you had an opportunity to uh, attend any meetings, the zoning board, or, or watch a meeting to familiarize yourself with? Uh, I, I haven't attended any meetings in person. I, you know, I did a little research on, looked at some of the minutes and stuff that was posted okay. online, but I haven't been to a meeting in person. No. And, and usually, if someone says they've been here 18 years, they're still a newcomer to a lot of people. So <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank you. You have an impressive resume here, and I, as a want for I want to make sure you're a good guy from Braintree. But as Bill mentioned, you've got a lot of uh, categories. You can narrow it down to one or two that you might want to be interested in what board? Um, you know, I'll be honest. So when I initially sent in the talent bank application, I was, you know, open to lots of things. Uh, um, then I got a call last week about this specifically, so I was like, oh, this is, you know, a great opportunity, but I'm not necessarily, you know, focused on one more than the other. I, I'm just really excited about any opportunity to learn more about Norwood and, you know, assist in any way I can. Okay. This is a position to get started learning because it's an associate, so you don't necessarily meet at every meeting when they know that somebody's going to have a conflict or for whatever reason be out of town and unable to attend the meeting, then they'll go to the associate since he was available, call them in, you know, to sit for that hearing, that meeting, okay. that evening. So over time, you get to do what you're saying, learn people, learn the town, learn some of the procedures and so forth that's, that are going on without jumping right into it at the same time. So it won't be, won't be fast paced immediately. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's a good thing. Just yeah. so you understand that. Yes. Yeah. And just to add to Mr. Plasco's point, you know, I think we've had conversations about making sure that professional development opportunities, should uh, you be an associate member, that those are available to you in trainings and things like that. So, um, you know, we appreciate your interest and we want to reciprocate that and invest back in. But uh, as Mr. Sad said, uh, you know, your resume is very impressive. Um, you didn't have to put your GPA on there to rub it in. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, definitely the type of person that we, we appreciate your interest and want to get you involved. So. Um, do you have any questions for us, Dan? Um, no, not at this time. Yeah, great. Any other, other questions? So um, we appreciate you coming in. Thank you so much. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll, we'll take a vote at the next meeting. Um, but if you have any questions in the interim that, that you can think of, you can get in touch with Jess or just email anyone from the board. Okay. All Thank right. you all for your Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Hogan. Hello. Thank you for being there. Thank you for Great. having um, me. If you could introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your interest, and then uh, we'll do the same thing, have some questions. Okay, so I am Eve Hogan, nice to meet you all. Uh, I am an attorney, I work for Public Consulting Group, um, which consults with uh, federal, state, and local governments and school districts. Um, I'm also a law professor at Northeastern, uh, teach intellectual property and business law. Um, I have been here in Norwood still, I guess, a newbie, 10 years, um, and <laughs> raising two kids here uh, at Coakley and, and Norwood High School. Um, love it here, and really just found my dream home. Um, got really interested in zoning and planning, <laughs> and ran for planning board. Um, was unsuccessful, but still really want to be inter 
want to be involved. Um, and so was hoping this was another way that I could contribute. Um, I think that in particular, my, my uh, background and talents are suited for this type of um, analysis, um, explaining, dispute resolution, and zoning really caught my eye. Um, as you probably know, I was really involved in a zoning matter, and so I really read the zoning bylaws um, front to back and got really interested. And I know I'm a kind of a nerd that way, but I love that stuff. And so it really was interesting to me, and I, I really wanted to be involved. So that's why I'm here. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. So we'll open it up uh, to the board, mm -hmm. and then if you have questions for us at the end. Sure. Uh, anyone like to start with questions for Ms. Hogan? Ms. Grow. I, I always like to ask candidates this, um, but uh, I would ask you, what do you believe is the unique perspective that you would bring to this board? Mm -hmm. um, so I think a couple things. I think, you know, professionally, my background is really in both breaking things down and explaining them as a professor, and then also resolving disputes and thinking about them from all angles. And so as an attorney, you know, it's not just about winning. I'm not a litigator. I do transactional work. And so it's not about winning. It's about really analyzing the truth of the matter, all of the facts, and being, you know, looking at all the stakeholders and coming to a fair conclusion. So to me, you know, being really neutral, fair, I know, you know, in the, in the zoning matter that I was involved in, it was, I was certainly firmly on one side, but it was because to me, um, there is, you know, the, the zoning special permit criteria that says that, um, you know, I, new things that are built here should, the benefits should outweigh the detriments for the town. And to me, I felt strongly that that was the case. I, that's not necessarily always the case one way or the other. And it, to me, really looking at it and always making sure that the special character of Norwood is um, really preserved, no matter what that is. Sometimes it's gonna be building and sometimes it's gonna be not, and sometimes it's gonna be a different type of building, but whatever it is, I think really paying attention to who we are as a town and who we want to be and also what the bylaws require us to do um, is something that I'm, I'm well equipped to do. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any questions from anyone else? Mr. Uh, I feel no. like I know it too much to ask a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Dudley? So uh, I'm, I'm probably asked the same question to everybody. So I, we sure. know that you've been active in, on the planning board side in terms mm -hmm. of attending and, and presenting information. Have you had opportunity on the zoning board of appeals to either attend or watch one of the meetings? I did or? watch them, yeah, on okay. Norwood Community Media. So I just went back to watch because I've never been there in person. And so I wanted to see what that was like. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. OK, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, do you have any questions for us? I do not. I just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be involved or to, to you know, offer to be involved, and so I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. We appreciate you being here. Sure. And, Good evening. Uh, like I said, we'll, we'll take a vote at the next meeting. And, okay. Um, but feel free to contact us if you have any questions in the interim. Great. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you very you. much. Have a good evening. Okay. Ms. Powell. Welcome. Yes, right. There you go. That's the hot seat. Thanks so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your interest. Um, if you could introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your experience and, and why you're interested in uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals, and then we'll open it up for questions. Excellent. Um, my name is Joanne Powell. Um, I've been living in Norwood for nine or ten years now. Um, I'm a licensed architect. Um, I mostly practice out in Metro West, and my current company is based in Metro West and North Shore. Um, so in the, that uh, practice, I've actually presented at uh, in front of several boards um, in several towns. Um, a lot of what I do is, at the very start, we start by doing a zoning analysis on a project. We decide whether we recommend to a client that they apply for a special permit. Uh, if they really want to do something that a variance is needed, we research and recommend whether we feel that's feasible or not. Um, so that's something that I'm very familiar with. So I was really excited when you called about, about zoning because I felt like it would be a, a good fit. Great, thank you. Um, you're, you're not a lawyer, so that was two lawyers and an architect. So, <laughs> yes. um, so we'll open it up to the board <coughs> if you have any questions for us. Mr. Sad. Sorry. I just want to say, I read this, and it's a very impressive resume. I don't think there's any conflict of interest on the associate or full member of the Board of Appeals. So uh, I just want to say congratulations on being here, and uh, good luck. And it's a very impressive resume. It's, it's spectacular. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I Thank you. That. And it'd be a newcomer, Noah. That's pretty high. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Plasco. No, actually, she answered one of the questions I was going to have. I was looking at um, your resume, and I wasn't quite certain about getting specifically involved in special permits, experiences, and so forth that you mentioned you have been involved in um, advising clients. Have you been involved in going through that process, or do they usually have their lawyers do that? Um, it's usually a combination. It depends on what town you're working in. It depends on what you're going for. A lot of times, our first, our first goal generally is to build something that's conforming with all the zoning. We don't have to go through that. Um, a lot of the times, it's because it's a non-conforming lot. Um, whether it's you know the frontage or the in you have to go through the process right. um, and then there are some things that just require a special permit and the client chooses that that's part of their program and we'll go through that process with them I've uh, in a handful of occasions I've been the one who presented but a lot of times I'm on the team that puts that um, together um, whether it's planning I've done planning board historic board presentations some zoning they've done some design review boards in some towns and uh, one of the towns I do a lot of work in have something called a large house review um, process so, so you, you indicated uh, some interest in um, historical preservation and is there a lot of that in your actual work a fair amount I've been very fortunate in that um, <coughs> I've been very fortunate my personal interest is in residential design and that's where I've been able to have my career focus um, and in New England there's an awful lot of historical um, homes to work on um, the firm that I was at prior and the firm that I'm currently at do a lot of renovation work on older homes but it's also just a personal interest. I also, for many years, was um, on the board of a local uh, museum uh, one town over. Um, again, it's just a personal thing, and life has dovetailed to make that uh, kind of work for me. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dunn. <coughs> Good evening. So uh, I'm following up with Mr. Plasto's question. So I notice here in your resume that you've done some work with the Norwood Historic Society for some walking tours. Correct. Just which tours were they? I'm just curious. So last summer they did a series of the different neighborhoods, yeah. and I did the Chapel Hill neighborhood. Um, and uh, a very nice woman, um, the short study, reached out to me, and she did the research on the the people and the the places. Mm -hmm. um, and I did the research on the architectural side, and we kind of presented it in tandem, and it was it was very very enjoyable. It was very nice. Great. And um, have you had opportunity to either watch or attend a ZBA meeting? Just you have. I have not attended, but I've watched them. Okay. I've also watched several of the planning boards because they're entertaining <laughs> far more than we are I'm sure <laughs> thank you thank you yeah and I think I'll just add to Mr. Nolly's point um, since uh, your experience I'm sure you've dealt with zoning boards fairly often um, just in your opinion what would you say um, makes a, a, for a good planning uh, a, a ZBA I'm sorry a, a zoning board um, navigating that process um, what are some things that have been helpful for you so I think the crux of it is understanding the zoning bylaw, what it allows and doesn't allow, but also understanding that people, sometimes they're not always being represented by a professional. You have to translate that for them, help them understand. I, I know the prior folks mentioned um, uh, finding a common ground, but sometimes it's also how things are explained um, and also understanding what they're putting in front of you, um, being able to read the drawings. Um, and sometimes you'll find like inconsistencies in the drawings. and. They have to understand that you're approving what's on the paper. Mm -hmm. If there's an inconsistency or a question, they just have to correct that and clear that up before you can approve it. It's, it's you know, um, and I also find a lot too, knowing what the particular bylaw regulates and does not regulate, um, what is in that purview and what is not. <laughs> you and Mr. Plasco would get along well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, do you have any questions for us? Um, no, I don't think so. Great, thank you. So, um, as I'm sure, I'm, I'm repeating myself, um, but uh, we'll make a, a we'll, we'll take a vote at the next uh, selections meeting in two weeks' time. Um, but please feel free to reach out and um, thank you for your interest. You know, very impressive resume. Thank you for so, having me. I appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank, and thank you for the work that you've done already with the historical clubs. Very good. Let's do it thank you. Good night. All right. Well, thank you so much. Yep. Okay, Mr. O'Neill. Hello, how are you? Good evening. Good, how are you? Great. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. We appreciate your interest. Um, if you could introduce yourself to the board, talk a little bit about your experience and your interest in the position, and then we'll open it up to questions. Sounds great. Thank you. 
Uh, Matt O'Neill, been here 20 plus years, uh, married into a uh, Norwood family. Uh, I have three beautiful daughters, uh, two of whom are still in high school uh, at Norwood High. Um, and uh, uh, by way of professional background, um, I think um, I am uniquely situated in so far as I have worked on both the regulatory side in government as well as the private sector side for uh, developers. And so um, I have a, a very deep understanding of the, uh, the uh, give and take and the, the pull and the tug of, of what it takes to, uh, to get things done and the sensitivities there too. And, and, uh, and so I'm not a lawyer, just to be clear. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm not an architect. Um, just a guy that uh, wants to uh, lend my time and uh, you know be uh, be beneficial to the town. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll open it up to the board for questions, and we can repeat our questions. It's okay. <laughs> yes, Miss Crow. Um, you mentioned it a little bit, but I always you know I can I can draw certain inferences from the resume and from our previous interactions with you. But I always like to still give the opportunity to ask uh, if there's some perspective uh, that you believe you have that's unique to you that you would bring to the board as compared to, the, to other candidates we might look at, what would that thing be? And you mentioned it a little bit, and if you yep. want to you know, sort of dive, dive into that further, uh, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I think that um, having been on both sides of the table, most folks don't have that skill set. They, they've never, they don't understand, um, you know, the the difficulties or the importance of certain aspects of development, um, um, either from the city side, the town side, and, and uh, you know what the zoning means to the town, and uh, or from the developer side where time is money, and, and uh, you know any delay uh, could effectively put somebody out of business. So it's 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 a uh, it's something that that I don't think most um, regulatory bodies are sensitive enough to, quite frankly. Um, and I can tell you that firsthand in the city of Boston, which is where I worked for a number of years, and, and uh, um, it's just something that I think needs to be more, uh, people need to be more cognizant of. Um, so I think that's about it. But, uh, you know, the other thing I would say is that um, one of the things I see is that, that planning and zoning are the critical components, and by and large, uh, cities and towns uh, they create plans, be it master plan or, or you know, uh, spot zoning, whatever the hell you want to call it, um, and, and the plans don't evolve over time, and so the zoning doesn't evolve over time. And consequently, you have a, a, a clash between what somebody wants to do today against an existing zoning law that may be outdated, and so I think that needs to be mediated and one of the things I, I'd like to think I'm extremely good at is actually bringing people together and mediating and, and coming out with a, a solution where everybody's happy with the uh, with the outcome thank you I want to say we got some impressive resumes here tonight folks <laughs> uh, I want to say it's really impressive you got thank some you. big hitters on here uh, no Republicans <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I like to say I was born a Democrat and raised a Catholic. I, wanna, uh, I know that you were very involved with Matt Brown's first big party at Gillette. I want to thank you for that. For oh, thank you. Yeah, Matt's my nephew, by the way. I know and, that. Uh, yeah. And um, all I can say is you, you're a go-to guy, what I can see on paper here. I don't know you. I probably met you in the hallway at the high school. Yep. But yep. Um, it's just really impressive well, the amount you. of contacts you have, the amount of people you've built and been involved with. And it's just um, the town's lucky to have you. Well, thank you. It just means I'm old. We're all old. <laughs> <laughs> Experience. Thank you. Yeah. Um, he's not as old. He's got, he's got kids in high school. I've got grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, actually not. Uh, it's a, an impressive resume, has been said. There's certainly a lot of aspects I'd be jumping at you tomorrow morning for. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, and the zoning board uh, work, it's a little more strict, mm -hmm. um, a little less room for compromise and bringing people together, per se, as much as evaluating 
the regulation whether you can make it fit, mm -hmm. but not a whole lot of wiggle room in a lot of instances. Um, you don't think you have any problem regula uh, recognizing that and dealing with the regulations as they as they stand? Not at all. Not at all. I mean, listen, the, you know, the, the the code is the code, right? And and you know, um, you know what's permitted, what's as of right, what's um, you know. Uh, you know, forbidden, you, you know, it's pretty clear. And, uh, it's good when it's um, uh, less uh, strict interpretation that leaves room for a little uh, wiggle room, a little in interpretation, but uh, yeah. a lot of times we don't quite have that in the zoning aspect. No, understood, but, but that doesn't preclude you from trying to suggest to the developer or the town that they, you know, go back to the drawing board and sure try to work something out that'll be beneficial to the town. Right. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Donnelly. Good evening. How, How are, are you? you, sir? I'm fine. Um, so uh, I noticed on your on your resume, it's it's, it's just a an acronym here. Former COS at the B B R A, the Boston Redevelopment. What is COS? Chief of Staff. Chief of Staff. Yeah. To the to the director. Sure. Yeah. And um, have you had opportunity, um, as you've thought about the ZBA, to either attend or uh, watch any of their meetings on online? I have not, uh, okay. with respect to the Norwood ZBA, okay. no, unfortunately. But uh, but I can tell you that I've been before the Boston ZBA many times, and and many of the other ZBAs throughout the state, uh, on behalf of uh, on behalf of clients and in Boston on behalf of the authority, the, mm -hmm. the redevelopment authority. So I've I've been on both sides of it. Great, All right. great. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for applying. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, I would just say, uh, you know, I, I appreciate your perspective and your experience, and I think that you, um, you positioned it well in, in speaking in that, um, seeing it from both sides. Um, I, I asked this of the previous applicant, but in your experience, having been in front of, uh, in, in specifically Boston, and, mm -hmm. you know, when have you seen the process work well um, for, through the ZBA? Um, when have I seen it work well? Uh, I mean, it, by and large, it works well because the rules are well defined, right? Mm -hmm. And and um, and um, that doesn't mean that at the end of the day, you know, the customer or the client is going to be happy all the time. But right. you know, if the rules are black and white, you know, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that and 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 I think. I think part of the issue that I see with most zoning boards is, once again, I'll go back to what I said earlier, is that the zoning hasn't kept up with the times and therefore you've got developers that want to do something that may or may not be right for the town or the, or the, the municipality at this time, uh, but the zoning doesn't, doesn't you know, follow suit and therefore that's where the rub comes in and that's where the, you know, the, the angst comes in and, and, and the, uh, you know, the difficulties. Sure, definitely. I think you know, we're um, talking about the MBTA zoning that's coming down from the state, and that's certainly one of the things. Exactly, are, yep. You know, um, so, yeah, I, I, I follow what you're saying. And just to make mention, too, um, you know, some of the things you were saying might also um, be a good fit for the, the master planning mm -hmm. um, committee that we're forming, and also some of the subcommittees that will eventually come out of that yes. master planning process. So. Um, regardless of how this works out, um, um, I think you know if you are interested. That would I am be definitely cool. interested. Yeah, very I'd great. Like Thank to help the town. Excellent. Um, do you have any questions for us? Mr. No, not Mario? at this time. You know, thank you for the time. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for being here, and um, we'll take a vote in two weeks. Um, and if you have anything that you need from us in between, just just let us know. Terrific. So thank you. Thank you. Thank have you. a wonderful night. Nice thank you. Have a good night. Good well. Okay, last but certainly not least, Mr. Lamberti. How's it going? How are you going? Thank you for being here. Uh, sure. Thanks awesome. for having me. Yeah, so uh, if you could introduce yourself, uh, talk a little bit about your interest in the position and your experience. We'll open it up uh, to questions from the board and then give you an opportunity to ask us questions. But. Great. Yeah, my name's Rob Lamberti. I've uh, been an Norwood resident for about 12 years. Uh, lived in Massachusetts for about 20, worked in the real estate industry, um, property management, facilities, project planning. Uh, recently, the last 15 years, been focusing on you know, uh, corporate fit outs, build outs globally. Have a lot of experience with zoning boards and project planning, stakeholder management. Currently a program manager at CBRE. Uh, so my interests 
I don't remember when I applied, probably last year or two, uh, <laughs> but I just have an interest. Like, we're going to be longtime residents of Norway. We have a couple of kids in the school, still in elementary, junior high, so I um, just thought I'd get involved, uh, offer my services in any way, any capacity. So I think the zoning board's a good fit in that I understand their requirements, I understand the different types of stakeholders that come before boards, and, you know, all the requirements that go into different <laughs> Rules, requirements, you know, people from construction teams to architect firms to lawyers to all of that and, and how that all has to be really put together and communicated and understand, you know, timing's a factor. So um, I think my experience and knowledge is, is helpful and beneficial and it's something that I, you know, can bring, but also I think being part of this is something I'd like to continue to to chase and just get more involved in town government in any way I can. And volunteering is a great way to start, I think. Great. Thank you, Robert. Yeah. Um, so we'll open up to the board for questions. Ms. Grow. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to, you know, we can't always fit everything that we want to express on our resumes. We only have so much room, right? Um, sure. But I always like to give the opportunity for a candidate to express if there's something that you believe is a unique perspective that you have that we would be challenged to find in other candidates that apply for this type of role with the board. Um, you know, could you tell us a little more about what that is and, and maybe even some examples? Uh, sure. I, I mean, I think my experience just in the real estate industry globally helps uh, understanding the requirements that go into the preparation to go before boards, permitting and things like that, understanding historical requirements. I mean, working in Boston and, you know, corporations down there are just um, both on the client side and contractor side. It's just been, you know, you understand why, I understand the why, I understand the needs and bringing those together. And I think that's why, you know, proper project manager at heart, something I love, I have a passion about. People ask me, what would you do if you had a TED talk? I talk about project management. I'm just yeah, I noticed agile in your... Uh, yeah, so yeah. I mean, understanding that, I, I'm really good at, at bridging gaps, bringing people together, make, helping under, people understand the requirements and why they have to do certain things, but working with them to achieve that and not, you know, being a... Uh, I, I look at it as you know what I do now. I'm program manager. I'm I'm a servant leader, right? I'm here to help others get better, do their job, look good. Um, I think I bring that same attitude towards uh, a committee like this, which would be, you know, trying to help local community grow and advance and, and come into the future, but in a responsible and safe way. And you know, I think my experience with safety reasons. Uh, requirements, working with different architecture firms around the world, different um, zoning requirements from <laughs> one project can have multiple requirements if you're doing it for a company that has offices in the United States, Europe, you know, Asia, things like that. And so my experience with putting all those ducks in a row and, and making sure that, you know, we have from, you know, every aspect accounted for and, and checked off and done on, you know, planned and, and you know, understanding schedules and timelines and all that good stuff. So um, I don't know if that sets me apart, but <laughs> I, I have my, you know, hands-on knowledge and empirical knowledge. So I think bringing that and helping residents and local community members um, understand and feel like they have, you know, it's not a, it's not a fight that they're going into, but more of like, how can we collaborate and meet your needs um, while, you know, adhering to laws and, and proper safety requirements. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say another one with an impressive <laughs> resume. You sound like a, a, a tough guy. guy. Yeah, okay. very tough. Thank you. But um, I could tell you've got uh, Wells Fargo. I mean, some big, big names on this resume. So I want to congratulate you and um, just keep getting involved. Thanks. Yeah. If, Thank you, you know, for if this doesn't service. work out, I'm happy to help in any way. I mean, I, I volunteer. I'm the treasurer on the North the, uh, middle school PTO, which I'm actually late for. Um, <laughs> you have a good excuse. Yeah, I'm, I'm a soccer coach mm -hmm. for my, my son's team. I mean, I pitch in wherever I can. I'm, uh, it's just who I am. I was raised that way. And, uh, you know, my perspective too, coming here uh, as an outsider, I was grew up in Texas and came here to Northeastern and graduated. So 
I have a really unique perspective of the United States, I think, and then bring that diversity to Norwood as well as helping people understand, you know, preserve what's great, but also look to the future and see how we can grow and make Norwood, you know, to fill its potential that I see. So, yeah. That's great. Thank you. Great job. Congratulations. Thanks. Mr. Blasco. No, just for us. Thank uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Stanley. Oh, thank you for applying and, and stepping up to, uh, to volunteer on, on this important role. Um, could, have you had an opportunity to familiarize yourself with any of the ZBA regulations or attend a meeting or anything I've, like uh, that yet? I, or? I've watched a couple of meetings. I attended one. Uh, there was some, some zoning issues in my own neighborhood over in the Callahan area. Uh, mm -hmm. Came up. So it's watching those and listening mm -hmm. and participating is... Uh, I've been there. I've tried to familiarize myself with the with the zoning requirements in preparation for this. Uh, it's a lot. I don't have it to memory yet, but it's something that you, you learn. And I haven't had to engage myself. So it's only two hundred pages. No big yeah, mm -hmm. it's, uh, between everything else. But yeah, I mean, it, they're there for a reason, and, and it's um, you know, I think other people said it's kind of cut and dry, and uh, you have to adhere to what's written, but. Um, you know, take lessons, learn from that, and see what can be changed. Or, or, you know, I always like to say, always keep a running list of opportunities for improvement, right? And, and see how things can go from there. But, um, yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, Great. thanks, Ms. Strong. Um, so I won't keep you uh, from your, your uh, treasurer, your PTO duties, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I just want to say, um, like Mr. Sad said, you know, really impressive resume it's awesome that you're interested in giving back and if this opportunity doesn't work out um, i would ask that maybe if, you know we could reach out for, for something Absolutely. else because i think you're definitely the type of person that we want to um, get more involved with with the town so we appreciate your interest absolutely yeah, yeah. i vote i vote for you guys all of you so <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate it it's nice to see you guys um yeah and uh did you have any questions for us before we let you go um, i do not no I yeah. appreciate the opportunity. It was nice to get the call, and uh, glad that you, you know somebody's looking at their resumes and, and taking it seriously. So it yeah. makes me happy to be a part of a town like that. So well, that's great, and, and definitely reach out um, between now and, and the next meeting if, if you have any questions. Absolutely. Um, great. Thank you for being here. Thanks for the opportunity. You. Good luck. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks for coming in. All right. That was fun. There's a, I mean, a lot of impressive people. I think the really cool thing too is that um, you know these seem like newer faces for us, and I, I think that's a really positive thing that people in the community are, are, are actively want to get involved. So you're, you're absolutely right, Mr. Kim. We've been trying to promote that for the last few years, and the seeds of our efforts are working. We're starting to see that uh, whether it's running for election or coming in for appointing right. appointments to different boards, it's working. Right, I, and I think um, you know all of those individuals, whether it be on the ZBA or something else, have a lot to offer. So we'll keep them busy. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so uh, moving back to the agenda, um, we did originally have under new business that we would take uh, a vote this evening. As I mentioned, uh, I think the best thing to do is is to sort of digest uh, the the interviews that we just had and um, move this to uh, two weeks' time, Jess, if that's okay. Do we need to take a motion on that? Uh, well, you got it on the agenda. If you want something, I could uh, make a motion to uh, table appointments till the, the next scheduled meeting. Second. Motion made by Mr. Plasco, seconded by Ms. Grow. All those in favor? Can I just say something on that? Yes, sir. I, I know um, that you mentioned at the beginning that we have two positions to fill, but I believe we actually have three. I believe it's three. And, and technically four, oh, wow. but there's one member that we didn't have in this evening for a reappointment who was in for interviews with the board previously when he first got appointed three years ago and was very impressive. He's also served a few times as the associate member and comes with high um, recommendations as to his effectiveness on the board. So I certainly, when we do make the appointments, would be making a, a motion to uh, reappoint that gentleman. But uh, I, I think it's real technically four, but assuming we do the reappointment, uh, three new openings. Correct. Great, and we would take a vote on the next meeting to um, formally reappoint Mr. Gorman, who we were speaking of. Yes. Great. Um, so 
Motion made by Mr. Plasto, second by Ms. Grove. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Great. Um, next item on the agenda is um, appointment of Board of Selectmen member for the Master Plan Steering Committee for discussion. Mr. Plasco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I actually thought we made that appointment, but I guess we just had some discussion and didn't formally make it, so maybe we should make it formally. I note also that um, there's no real standard rule, but in the um, past at least five years, we've kind of had appointments like this handled by the chairman, not the board. But if we're going back to the board, uh, getting involved in these appointments, I'd like to nominate uh, Sockman Donnelly. Second. Second on the nomination. Um, nomination made uh, by Mr. Plasco, seconded by Mr. Sav. All those in favor of nominating Mr. Donnelly as the Board of Selectmen representative on the Master Plan Steering Committee? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. Well, thank you, fellow board members. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> and, uh, just want to say that uh, this this selectman's appointment is of one of the one of the eleven people who will serve on the steering committee. And as we go forward with the master plan, looking at what other communities have done, um, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for um, members of the community to serve um, on the master board process beyond the steering committee. And uh, tonight, I was really uh, well engaged with the, um, each of the individuals appearing before us. And it's good to know that out in our community, we have people who are interested and qualified. And any of the folks that came before us today would be, I think, wise to consider um, participating in the master plan as it evolves in time. So, but thank you again. Great. Congratulations, Mr. Donovan. Um, Mr. Mazzucco, just um, for those maybe watching at home, I know we've talked about a timeline for some of the things um, involved with uh, the Master Plan Committee and uh, a social media post went out from the town. I don't know if you could expand on that just a little bit. Sure. So the plan as it is now, we're hoping to have a committee largely recruited towards the end of June. Uh, have that committee get together sometime in July. The first step once the committee is together and they sort of appoint a chair or co-chairs among them will be then to go out to bid for a consultant for the plan. We really wanted the committee to be formed first. Some towns do it differently. They get a consultant first and then they start a committee. We wanted the committee to be vested in the process, to be able to look at the scope of work, and hopefully we get a couple of folks interested in actually bidding on that project. They know MAPC has been doing a lot of them lately, but for them to be able to vet the consultants or the, uh, that we use, and then the work would really start sometime around the fall once we're assembled, once we have a consultant on board, and we're ready to kick off. Great. And just a reminder to people at home, how can they uh, submit? Sure, send us a resume and letter of interest at, to masterplan at norwoodma.gov. Excellent. And there's six, uh, there'll be six residents appointed by a committee that consists of yourself as the chairman of the Board of Selectmen, uh, Brian Hatchie, the chairman of the Planning Board, and um, the moderator, Jerry Slater. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, next agenda item is a discussion of the water and sewer rates. Uh, discussion and approval of the board mr. Mizuko. thank you mr. chairman one of the least enjoyable things we have to do annually is uh, <laughs> setting annual water and sewer rates so as a reminder for the board our water and sewer rates correspond to the budget that town meeting approved in May it really is our cost of running the water system the cost components the major cost obviously is the water and sewer treatment from the Mass Water Resources Authority uh, any capital or debt service that we have as well as our local operating costs we're asking the board again this year to look at splitting the increase into possibly two votes, one now and one later in the fall. We did this, I think, two or three years ago. Uh, on the one hand, to mitigate a larger increase, but we have a couple of unique circumstances this year that we think splitting the rate into two increases would make, uh, the second one may not necessarily be an increase, but would make sense. One of them is, as the board knows, we've moved towards trying to account for all of our water sewer expenses in a single fund to make sure it's covering all of its costs. This will be the first full year we've had an enterprise fund our books will close as of June 30th. It'll take some time on the books to find out what's um, the retained earnings in the water sewer enterprise fund. Now the long-term goal is to build up a certain level of retained earnings. It helps with your bond rating, your overall financial picture. You also need to be able to insure against any losses to the fund. In the past, they would come out of free cash, so we would lose free cash or surplus revenue if water and sewer didn't generate enough money to cover its cost. The corresponding positive of that is it would generate free cash, but the goal is for water and sewer to pay for all water and sewer related expenses. We're on target to have a good year. That's partially weather related. Last summer was a little on the dry side, which helps sell more water and sewer. We pay on the back end as our rates go up and as our usage goes up, the MWA charge 
follows a year behind. So it's a short-term gain, but long-term mm -hmm. comes with uh, <clears throat> some cost changes. But we want to close the first year out, make sure we have a positive balance. And then if that balance is significant enough, we want the board to be able to look at it and decide how much of it we want to use towards rate relief. Um, as I said, we want to build that fund balance up. We don't want to build it all at once. We need to leave a cushion, but we want to make sure the first year we can take a hard look at it and say, okay, year one we collected this, we had a good year, and then you're able to either use your retained earnings to lower your cost for residents or you maybe make capital purchases in the fall out of them. So that was uh, reason number one. Reason number two is we are we did put in the budget for a rate study. It's been a couple of years, really since before COVID, when we've had a third party analyst come in and actually look at the rates, look at the rate structure, look at the revenue generating requirements, and we'd like to do that for a couple of reasons. One is we always like to have that third party check on are we generating enough in rates to cover the cost? Are we generating too much or too little? But also to look at the rate structure. We haven't changed our mm -hmm. rate structure in quite a while, and it may not need to change, but as the board knows, we have one charge for the first five uh, cubic hundred feet, a separate charge after that, and then there's the meter charge. So somebody looking at that and deciding if we still want to do that, do we still want to have the 60% um, sewer charge as a portion of water? Is that structure uh, typical of the surrounding towns, or is it another Massachusetts example of <laughs> people doing it their own 350 different ways? 349 different ways. Yeah. I mean, cities and towns don't even use the same metric mm -hmm. to calculate how much water somebody's realistically using, so everyone does it differently. There is some form of a charge for the volume of water, yeah. a some form of a fixed charge, and sewer ranges from what we do to everything and nothing all at once. And yeah. the state law actually lets you be, it's not like electric rates, which are very heavily regulated. It's not nearly as regulated. Our system works for us. Again, most of these systems developed 100 years ago, and towns have just sort of gone um, gone through so I, and it doesn't mean we have to change it there's no magical change to the formula that makes the cost of water and sewer go down if we need to raise 20 million dollars to cover water and sewer costs however we shake that out we're going to need to raise that 20 million dollars but it's time to look at it the rate formula gets complicated it gets um, complicated to figure out exactly how much we need to generate rate revenue and look at the different um, revenue generating units and do the math across that. So there might be a benefit to doing that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll have to settle in the fall how we want to approach using the meter charge. The number is set sort of artificially now. Um, it's been sort of artificially set for a while. We want it to go towards the regular replacement of meters. What we want to bring back to the board in the fall is determining what exactly we want that to be. Do we want just a flat dollar amount for the physical cost of replacing let's say five meters a year, 5% of the meters a year, 10% of the meters a year, what sort, of a, a sway do, uh, what sort of a swing do we want to make sure we have enough money when we have a meter problem? And then at what level do we want to say it's the cost of the meter? If it's just the physical piece, you're, which we really haven't done in quite a while, look at it that way, but if you're looking at just the physical meter, you're missing everything else that goes into that fixed cost. On the electric side, that fixed charge is not just the physical piece of equipment, it's the software on the back end, and it's the billing system on the back end to, to actually make it run. The model we use on the electric side is usually what would it cost to issue a zero bill to maintain some of the, uh, the billing system. But we want to bring that back with a couple of different models and say, okay, where do we want this to be? What do we think the number will be? It will likely come down because, as I said, the number of going back 10 years have been set at different rates for different reasons. So we want to bring a more complete picture to the board in the fall when we have this information, which will impact the second half, if you will, of the rate increase. And nobody likes to increase rates. What we'd be looking at for starting on July 5th uh, sorry, July 1st would be an increase that would impact the average residential rate payer, possibly 5 to $8 a month um, on the higher end. We have residential rate payers that have a $25 or $35 a month bill. We have residential rate payers that have a $70 or $80 a month bill. We have some that have a $150 a month bill. It ranges based really on your usage and your household size. And of course, on the commercial side, um, we have some rate payers that pay uh, $1,000 a month, some that pay $10,000 a month. We have a large customer that pays well over $100,000 per month in water and sewer charges. So the impact on the commercial side is the, the rate, if you will, is the same, but it's a little bit harder when you're predicting when you have such a big increase what the impact is on somebody paying that share uh, volume. Yeah, if you, if you could just go back, because I think the people probably watching at home are just the one question they have is how much will my water bill go up? Four or five bucks a month. Yeah. Okay. Worst case scenario. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, that's fine. That's why we always try to phrase it. Well, you're right. What is my bill going to go up? And again, it's tough because your bill, everybody's bill, we, every time we do a study, we have about a third, <clears throat> a quarter of a neighborhood gets a $35, $38 a month bill. A quarter will get 70 or 80 And then, you know, maybe 10 or 20% might get 
150 every now and then you do have somebody if you're watering your lawn every day in the summer you're going to have a significantly larger bill which is why we actually always recommend you don't do that so a few dollars a month is where it'll go up now we think part of that will be offset in the fall with a reduced meter charge but we're not at that point where we're able to um, look at what the meter is there's two options before the board that um, you call it option one and option two only a small difference um, maybe a dollar or two a month. One of them makes sure that we adjust so that no water is being sold less than really what we pay for it. Um, sometimes that happens on the very small or lower users. It tends to happen more on the residential side. It creates sort of a, an unintentional subsidy to the average residential user. The other side of that is a bulk of our debt service on the water side for water relining really benefits residential rate payers. So larger commercial payers are still sort of benefiting the the uh, residential rate payer um, sure. through that process. Most of the water lining project that we're in, I think the third year of, uh, 80 to 90% of is realistically so residential. Goes towards residential. Yeah. Okay. Um, questions from the board? No, not for me. Mr. Plasco. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I shared with the manager this afternoon my frustration of getting this information just Friday, the 75 pages of this. Um, we have to read over. We have had a statement in the past that when we have something enlarged like this, we'd like to get it before the Friday packets so we might have some extra time. We actually, after all, are volunteers and sometimes we have personal things going on, so just that Friday before isn't necessarily enough time when it's something as involved as this is. Um, but that being said, um, I have a little bit of comfort level in what I was able to look at and the fact that we're talking six months because even if we think we made a mistake and we went too high, we can lower it and, and set it for the uh, rate payers uh, and make up any quote unquote error we might have made, uh, although I don't think we will, but just saying because we're only six months, we, we have a lot of flexibility to deal with the, the situation. But I would, would like to, an explanation that I don't quite understand what we're doing here. At your, your blocks here, I'm looking at page 49 actually. Um, at the bottom, it, it says, and further to set the water rate charge for municipally owned properties at 25% of the current rates. Why? At, at, it's sure. During the budget balancing process, we um, budget balancing came to a decision that their recommendation to balance the budget would be that we not charge ourselves the full freight of water and sewer for the water and sewer that the town consumes. The reason being that what's built into our rate are things like our salaries and our overhead and the billing software. So we're sort of taking, we're double charging ourselves in a sense. We're legally required to do it on the electric side. So this adjustment down to municipally owned properties would reduce that overall amount, consistent with what budget balancing adopted. Um, I don't remember discussing that a budget balancing, but <laughs> um, so we are paying for our actual usage and for our share uh, of um, water that might be lost, water that the town uses, water watering the fields, keeping the grass green so the kids can play in safe fields and so forth. And now you want us to pick up 75% more of the no, towns? Less. So the town's water bill would go down. That cost gets split over the system, but what we're actually doing is we're sort of taking taxpayer money and paying ourselves, and we're looking to reduce what we're paying ourselves. Because in a sense, you're paying yourself for your own overhead. Mm -hmm. Paying yourself for your own overhead. Because built into that water bill is a portion of, for instance, the labor costs. So a portion of the DPW director's salary is an example and his benefits. So let's call it $1,000. We're raising taxes to pay for a portion of that through the water rates, but we actually are paying for it through the tax rate anyway. Yeah, we're, but we're going to an enterprise fund, so that enterprise fund is supposed to be covering all costs and rent instead of the rate payer. Correct. The, the town could charge itself nothing for water and sewer. Some towns do that. Uh, I don't think it should be nothing. Um, but this is the number that was achieved during the budget balancing process that this is an, an avenue where the town doesn't have to charge itself its full freight for its own utility. Remember that discussion? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think I would just add, Mr. Mizuka, that um, you know, I appreciate the work that went into this, especially from Mr. Collins, so thank you to him. But it is a lot, and I know um, 
that revisiting it again in six months is great, and um, but it's it is a lot of information and um, to to consume, and, and not that we don't trust that that the work is is accurate because I um, I appreciate it, and I, I think the way that it was presented with different options is really helpful in understanding the, everything. Um, so just kind of adding to what Mr. Plasco said, if there's a way to get that information in advance and, and um, you know, if, if Mr. Collins or if someone needs to come in for a meeting before, you know, just to help us get a, more of a baseline, just to stay on top of it. And I know that it's... Sure. Part we, of the challenge is... I know we do it every year, so... It's, yeah, it, it's, I, I would never say we copy last year's memo, but most of it is in the, uh, the same annual memo and calculation. Yeah. Part of the time crunch we have this time of year is that none of these figures are real until town meeting has approved a budget. Right. So it comes up reasonably shortly after town meeting, even though we start the work ahead of that. We could look at it pre-town meeting, but then you're sort of saying, okay, we think this is going to be what the rate is. And mm -hmm. town meeting historically hasn't made, you know, they're not adding $10 million to the water budget or reducing it by $10 million. But the numbers, based on the cost projections, aren't real until town meeting has voted that this is going to be the budget. Mm -hmm. But we can always try to do it pre-town meeting next year. Yeah, or even just sort of the, the, you know, the complexities there and just, you know, trying to get that to us in advance, something like that, you know, so. Or even, or even instead of like tonight, but it's here like, here it is and let's vote, but really not gonna increase this till July 1. We need time to get, um, mm -hmm. there's a hearing notice requirement, there's a billing notice that it takes time to build it into the system. We couldn't do it uh, second meeting of June and have it ready for July 1st. You could have it in June and then have rate, you know, you could raise the rate whenever you want. There's no requirement. We try to time it to an even calendar or fiscal year. So as we're looking back over financials and you see an increase, you can understand, okay, why did it go up? It's tied in. Uh, the longer you delay a rate increase, it can cause a higher increase. So if we said, let's do it in August, okay, we can do it. But mm -hmm. instead of even 5.2%, it might be that, it's, well, it's 5.3 since we're... And if we do the rate analysis and, and we go through this process again in a year, the information that we'll have from that will kind of make this easier. I mean, you're, you're, you're gonna get this level of complexity every year when we set the rates. It's, it's looking at everything comprehensively. If we have a new rate structure, we'd have to have some meetings to make sure that that's understood. We might be able to simplify the process a bit. Yeah. Uh, again, our particular system of, you know, the one charge for zero to five CCF and then after, adds to the complexity level of trying to say, well, what's the rate increase? It's, well, it's one percentage for the right. first portion and it's a second percentage for the second portion, which is where most of your bill is calculated. Except if you're a really low user, then you don't factor into that category. Right, and do we know offhand how many like of that low user category we have? So it would be somebody with a water bill probably less than $30 a month. I don't know the uh, off the top of my head if you could, yeah. very low user. Got it. Uh, okay. A typical elderly person living by themselves probably has about a $40 a month bill. Okay. But those low bills are a little bit into the second half of the rate category. Got it. But a large commercial user hits it day one of the month. Okay. Mr. Dahlman, I know you had your hand up. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I, I know we, when we're talking about an enterprise fund, particularly when it comes to water and sewer, that um, we have to generate rates that provide the service. I think we all understand that. And uh, looking at the report, um, on the revenue side, obviously, the um, not using the meter fund anymore to fund operations, we, we have a, a, a revenue hole. Um, I think I know the answer to these questions on the budget side. Um, on the local costs, you know, we have labor going up 30 percent. That, um, I assume, is due to just transferring of employees from general government into the enterprise fund for water? Yeah, we, it's not new headcount? Really? Correct, no. There's been no change in headcount or um, any significant changes with um, how much labor is applied to it other than we're trying to get the correct amount of what's water and sewer budgeted for water and sewer. Um, mm -hmm. you, I think this town meeting and the last town meeting we've made adjustments in the budget just trying to make sure that we're getting what's accurately water and sewer. Uh, going back four or five years, we sort of budgeted a top number for DPW and then what we would do is at the end of the year, we kind of allocated out where we thought it went. The problem there is if you had a, um, let's say you were down somebody in the water sewer crew, you just didn't get that allocated. So it was mm -hmm. hard to get an accurate number of, look, this is what we're budgeting. This is what's actually water and sewer. It was just sort of thrown where it needed to go. Right. And um, so option one versus option two. Option uh, two, is, it, the report is saying that the option two would be more equitable. It would put a little more of the burden of the rate increase on residential as opposed to commercial. Can you just talk us through that one more time in terms of what, um, how does option one, for example,
put an extra burden on, on commercial and hence water use. It's just how mathematic I'm just trying to get my head around Sure. So at, at the end of the day, both, what, both the MWRA does and what we do is the cost of water is boiled down to, let's call it a gallon, it's a cubic mm -hmm. feet. So let's say it's a dollar a gallon. You want to make sure that your rates are actually raising enough to cover that exact amount. And sometimes if you're on a very low use schedule, you're not actually generating enough to cover our cost per gallon, if you will. And as a result, it's shifted on the higher users who are using a lot of it. It's not intentional, it's just sometimes the way the rate structure works out. So if we were to say, look, it costs us a dollar for every gallon of water that we provide, you wanna make sure you're collecting a dollar across the board, not 80 cents over here and a dollar 20 over here. It's very slight, but it is, it's not intentional. If the board wanted to look at, and this might be something we can do in the fall, whether you wanted a fundamental different rate for commercial water use, that's something you can look at, but you don't want it to be an unintentional subsidy from one side of the ledger to the other, where one already exists when it comes to some of the capital projects. Especially, yeah, the relining. The, yeah. Right, if we were an owned system and we had our own water or sewer plant, it's sort of the reverse because the, the bulk beneficiaries of that are usually commercial, larger commercial users. Our water lining is almost exclusively benefiting residential users. Okay, and so looking at the um, moderate residential user in light, um, the difference between the rate increase for option one and option two on an annual basis is not very large. So I, I think that that figure that's quoted in here from a percentage basis looks very large, but when you apply it to the rates, it's it's relatively small in actual dollars. Um, so there are there are a lot of charts to to, to show here, and, and you know I, I agree, with Mr. Lane and Mr. Plasco, it's a lot to absorb. Um, but I, I do thank Mr. Collins for the uh, the detail provided. The um, one comment at the end of his report, um, and this is probably Tony and Mr. Mazuko, just a, a, a project update. So he references MWRA report that says that 50 to 55% of our wastewater outflow is, is due to broken sewer pipes and illegal connections, where in the average in, in, for an MWRA community is 30 to 35%. Maybe you can give us an update in terms of what Norwood is doing to address that so we can get closer to the norm as opposed to 50 to 55% wastewater sure. loss. Absolutely. We're, uh, we've been engaged in, uh, we got a project approved a few years ago for the airport area, which there's a large sewer line that runs um, throughout the airport. It's a particularly wet area. We knew that there was significant inflow coming in. Um, to that particular pipe. We're in the project phase right now of um, beginning to cap that and make repairs. And we, the DPW is fairly confident that once that's done, um, that should have, a, we're hopeful, a significant impact on rates. Somehow if that doesn't have, uh, if not an impact on rates, an impact on that number. Somehow if it doesn't, then there's some other significant inflow into the system. Because if you picture a, um, an old sewer cap where water can get in, this is an area where it would almost be flooding up until that level. Mm -hmm. Significant, significant flow was going in. And we get charged for that. So every, every gallon that goes in, if you will, the MWA charges us to treat right. that. So we're hopeful that that project will have a big impact. If somehow it doesn't, then we've got other inflow issues to address throughout the uh, system. Right. Which, which we do some regular addressing of it um, annually anyway. It's illegal connections, and that's just, I know that sounds nefarious. It's not always as nefarious. Somebody might have a storm drain that they plugged into their sewer 75 years ago right. um, and didn't realize it, but the more of those you have, the more it causes mm -hmm. an impact. And we always take advantage of MWRA's uh, grant and loan programs for I&I &I work. We are a significant, uh, significant user of those. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mizuko. Any other questions from the board? Just, Mr. A, Sad. just a quick, uh, Mr. Manager, um, Buckmaster Pond, mm -hmm. any looking at what we can do with that, with the water that's in there that we own? Would you like the candid answer? Yeah. I wouldn't drink that water or put it in our water pipes for... Okay. We, unless we absolutely had to. Okay. Um, if you were to look at beyond the potential litigation, um, which incidentally we've been litigating Buckmaster Pond one way or another since the 20s, by the time you get a treatment plant set up or you try to get the system set up to bring the water in, I don't think you'd ever save a dollar. I think you'd be spending a fortune for a, um, a local water source. Doesn't mean we should ever get rid of it. It's worth its weight in gold in that sense, but I think to, last time we did a feasibility study of looking at it, incredible amount of money for what realistically wouldn't be a gain. The challenge with the MWRA, some communities that don't join feel like they don't want to pay for the rest of the system's maintenance of the plant. I look at it the opposite way. We're joined with 40 other towns paying for the maintenance of a water treatment plant and a sewer treatment plant. I think that's a much better system than trying to go, um, go on our own. Maybe we can get Fred in there and see if the MWRA <laughs> wants to buy some water from us. Um, yeah. Well, I'd sell it to them. He, um, yeah. <laughs> 
it, it's kind of funny. They've uh, they've gone from a very um, there's a lot of communities who are indicating now an interest to join the MWA, which yeah. has been a, not the case for years. And I think a lot of it has to do with there are areas of the state that are um, the Ipswich River Basin for they're strained, and so their water sources aren't as reliable as they once were, whereas MWA is so. Uh, now more towns are, are indicating interest, but the MWA is showing more flexibility with entrance fees and things like that. The uh, source water is um, quite abundant and capable of adding communities to it. Yeah, one, but one if we did go to Buckmaster Pond years ago for a um, for a drinking source, it would have required a great deal of investment in pipes, water treatment plant, things like that. And I would say we probably get a water quality complaint every day compared to the water quality we're getting from the MWA, which is... Uh, Pretty good. Nationally, we're lucky that we have such a source of clean water and such a reliable source. Oh, yeah. We know that most of the state had water bans uh, this summer. Based on its water level, and area communities didn't have to. Everyone was still asked to. The state still was technically in drought status. They actually, I think, calculated, I remember Bob and I were talking about this, for us to actually have to have a water ban to require one. Um, the MWRA or the Quabbin would need, I think, eight summers like we had last summer in a row. So it's just a significant yeah, source wow. of incredibly clean, incredibly fresh water. And to Bob's point, could we could activate Buckmaster? Sure. Uh, $40, 50000000 million that your water and sewer rates would have to pay for. It just, I don't know to what extent it would ever realistically be feasible, but. Mm. Uh, In my time, we did a study, and it was very feasible at that time. Uh, it was very involved. It would probably have a lot of resistance from Westwood and difficult to do, but we were told in the numbers that we were shown by consultants and everything that it was very feasible. However, the amount, oh, I forget the numbers, so I won't quote them, but the amount uh, that we would have got is limited of how much water can be drawn and, and mm -hmm. retrieved from that. And probably at today's cost, it would mm -hmm. probably be very prohibitive. Right? Mm -hmm. Two other things, if I can mention, just as we're um, talking about our source of water, which is a significant cost to the town. It's millions of dollars a year. Um, from an economic development standpoint, the ability to have virtually unlimited water in the sewer makes it much easier to attract um, any type of um, commercial business along Route 1. It's a significant um, selling point that we can water and sewer any point in the town with an unlimited supply of uh, sure. water and sewer. Another item that's worth uh, mentioning, there's a lot of, and has been for the last year or so, discussion in the news about PFAS or forever chemicals in water. Not a problem the MWA area has. Um, some of our neighboring systems do have that challenge. Um, we, have an inter we have interconnection agreements, but we have an emergency interconnection with Sharon, for instance. I don't ever see a situation where their water enters our pipes. It would likely only be going the other way. The same thing if we were to, um, we've talked with Walpole about a similar, agree similar agreement. Um, we have really perfectly clean, reliable water. We would only want it going out, not anything else that ever coming yeah. in. And that's actually, just not to belabor the point, but since I like talking about water and sewer, um, huh. Some of what happened in Flint was introducing a different water source into a system that had been calcified and built one way for 50 or 60 years. So even if we were to, you know, if we got a grant to build a new water treatment plant and it was reasonable, you start putting different water into your system, it can create a lot of problems down the road. Yeah, I might add that, that looking, when we looked at Buckmaster, you asked about Buckmaster, that wasn't really intended to mix no, in and be part of uh, lowering water rates because we can supply our own water cheaper. It was mostly for a backup mm -hmm. for a case of emergencies and what have you. And uh, MWRA since then, I don't know if they've completed it even, but they started bringing in a uh, second uh, line for us right. for those purposes. So that kind of stopped uh, Buckmouse's uh, work at that time as well. Okay. <coughs> right, a redundant line. Right. Redundant, right. thank you. Do you know if they've actually, they haven't actually finished that. I thought they had. Oh, have they? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think they have. Our portion, yeah. Uh, thank you. Just haven't had to use it. <laughs> so it sounded like perhaps Mr. Donnelly was uh, working his way towards uh, making a uh, motion. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I I'd make a motion that we um, uh, approve option two for um, the rate increase for this coming year. Motion made by Mr. Donnelly to uh, approve, uh, accept uh, option two is the water sewer rate increase uh, second. Mr. Plasco, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Unanimous. Great. Thank you. And um, let Mr. Collins know. You know we appreciate it. He, he is watching this evening. Is he? He is. All right. You don't make him, do you? No, no. <laughs> 
He did do a fantastic <coughs> job, though. Great. Watch the Celtics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I really appreciate the linear regressions, too. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Good. Okay, next item on the agenda, um, car wash request. Student Council submitting request from the class of 2026 Student Council to use the municipal lot for a fundraising car wash on June 3rd, 2023 from 8 a.m. until 12 p.m. Speaking of water. <laughs> All right, move for approval. Motion to approve made by Mr. Donnelly, seconded by Ms. Grove. Yes. Just one comment on yes. this side, because we get the question about once a year, um, all the car washes. The DPW does monitor the water use. comes out to less than $500 a year for a typical year full of car washes. So, Awesome. Well worth it. Great. Thank you. Uh, motion made by Mr. Allen, seconded by Ms. Gro. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Unanimous. Great. Uh, item 4.5, car wash request. Varsity cheerleading. Submitting requests from the Norwood High Varsity cheerleading team to use the municipal lot for a fundraising car wash on August 5th, 2023, from 8 a.m. until 2.30 p.m. Pleasure of the board. Motion. Good. Motion <laughs> approved made by Mr. Sad, seconded by Ms. Grow. All those in favor? Aye. Chair votes aye, unanimous. Uh, item 4.6, one day liquor request, Barrel House Z. Submitting requests from Barrel House Z for a one day liquor license for an event at Winsmith Mill, 61 Endicott Street, on June 3rd, 2023, from 12 p.m. until 4 p.m. with 300 guests expected. Motion to board. approve. Motion to approve made by Mr. Donnelly, seconded by Ms. Grow. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Chair votes <coughs> aye, unanimous. Item 4.7, One Day Liquor Request, Norwood Portuguese Club. Submitting requests from the Norwood Portuguese Club for a one day liquor license for an event at the Norwood Portuguese Club at 1090 Washington Street on June 10th, 2023 from 6 p.m. until 12 a.m. with under 100 guests expected and a second event on July 15th, 2023 from 6 p.m. until 12 a.m with 85 guests expected. Pleasure motion of the to, board. A motion to approve, Mr. Chair. Motion to approve made by Mr. Donnelly, seconded yeah. by Mr. Sad. Mr. Clarity, that's a both request. For both requests, yes. Motion is for both requests. Thank you, Mr. Plasco. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Chair votes aye, unanimous. Item 4.8, road closure request, American Legion Post 70. It says 0K, I'm assuming that's a 5K road race. No, it's a zero it's a, K. It's a zero K. What's it? I, I guess I, I missed this. I don't think a lot of running is going to be involved in this particular event. Yes, <laughs> uh, there we go. Um, <laughs> submitting requests from the American Legion Post 70 for their annual Legion baseball fundraiser from June 4th, 2023 on Day Street from 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. Pleasure of the board. What they want from us is a closing of the street, right? Yeah, I believe yeah. they made a request similar to this last year. Got it. Uh, motion approved made by Mr. Plasco. Second. Seconded by Mr. Donnelly. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Unanimous. Uh, item 4.9, Common Vic request to Pico Salvadoreno 2. Submitting requests for a Common Vic license for Topico Salvadoreno 2, located at 514 Washington Street, to be open seven days a week from 6 a.m. until 9 p.m. Pleasure of the board, or questions? Do we normally ask the applicant to come before us? Uh, I'm just trying to differentiate this particular request from, for example, Veggie Crust, who came in here several months ago for, um, I thought, a similar license. Yeah, um, to answer your question, Mr. Arley, I think we have um, kind of gone back and forth a little bit on this, at least in my time. Uh, it, I'm happy if, if the board feels more comfortable making it a common practice to have uh, the applicant come in. I thought um, in looking at their application, especially with the floor plan submittal that they had um, provided us with the information. But I, I do think it's nice to actually meet the proprietor. So um, anyone has any Yeah, years comment? ago, you, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, we've gone back and forth in recent years. Um, in the past, they would come in 
actually gave them an opportunity to promote their business mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and what have you, mm -hmm. and, and for us to meet them and know who we were licensing. Uh, then it became a little more maybe COVID or whatever brought it on. I'm not quite yeah. sure mm -hmm. when it began, but if everything seemed to be in order, nobody had any questions. It wasn't like a liquor license that right. by law required a public hearing. We would, right. uh, if we were comfortable, just just uh, just approve. Um, so we could do it either way. We're not required by law mm -hmm. for this matter right. mm -hmm. uh, right. to have a hearing. I would just like to make a comment. Uh, one of the things, like you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, that we got the uh, floor plan, which is one of the things we require. Another thing that I think if you read the, the laws, they um, ask for, and we don't see, we have a, a sheet here for new businesses to what to supply us, and it's not listed here. I think we should add it. I know I'm always curious as to what the menu, what the sample menu might look like, what kind of business are they actually in. Yeah. Sometimes they're um, ethnic, uh, related and, sorry for my being ignorant, but sometimes I have no idea what they're oh, yeah, yeah, proposing no, to, to serve, and I think we should be asking for, not that this one necessarily would have to be held up for that, but yeah. I'm asking for in the future that we add that to this uh, new business list where we would ask for and make sure we get a sample uh, menu for example, Mrs. Donahue would always ask somebody who was starting opening at 7 to 9 o'clock in the morning, what are you serving? <laughs> are you that's, serving? that's breakfast type food. What are you serving? And if you had that menu, you might be able to answer that question yes, yourself, I, you know? I remember her asking what Taco Bell was going to serve. <laughs> yeah. mm. that that's a very subjective, challenging <laughs> question. You know, those of us that enjoy pizza for breakfast, yeah. it's like, well. Um, I think, uh, so you're suggesting, Mr. Plasco, uh, sort of, mm an amendment to the new business requirements, um, which I think is a good idea to add uh, a, a menu or, or, or sample mock-up if they don't even have one completed, yeah. at least what the, the basic <coughs> cuisine is going to be. You know? Going yeah. forward. Going forward. Yeah. Like, yeah. With this particular license, I think it's pretty well in order. I agree. And I, I think uh, if the board's comfortable, I think maybe just going back to the practice of um, inviting these applicants in um, you know, my only hesitation is if we've got longer appointments and it's later on in the agenda and they're, they're sitting here for a couple hours. It wouldn't, um, but I do think that the, the benefit of having them here and, and introducing themselves to the community, if they're new to the community, um, maybe outweighs the weight that they would have to endure at the meeting. So um, did you, did we have a motion? I'm sorry. I'll make a motion to approve the um be a license as submitted. Motion to approve made by Mr. Donnelly, seconded by Ms. Grow. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The chair votes aye, unanimous, great. Congratulations and welcome. Um, next item, uh, surplus request, Norwood Fire Department, submitting a request to dispose of surplus property. Mr. Marzucco, do you have anything on this? Uh, nothing uh, further, Mr. Chairman, just occasionally our current policy requires that we bring any surplus disposals to the board. Any equipment we have does have to be uh, disposed of in accordance with the state's procurement laws. Mr. Plasco. Why, why don't we do trade-ins? Um, usually when we're getting rid of a vehicle, there's not necessarily as much value. We well, have you're, been ta you're talking about maybe up to $10,000 here? We usually list the vehicles on a site called Municipid. Um, we've been very successful at selling a lot of stuff on that site. We, um, we can look into trade-ins, but we just generally we have not been getting the same type of value. Usually when we're getting rid of a vehicle and looking to declare it surplus, it's in pretty rough shape. When we put it on municipal bids, so we're going to, uh, do we set a minimum? Sometimes we do. It depends on the value of the item. We wouldn't sell something for a dollar. So this memo, you said these vehicles are like way less than 10 grand? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean... I think we should go for as much as we think they might possibly be worth, but at a minimum, when we're talking vehicles, it would be the junk value. Yeah, and um, we, we usually set a minimum. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the uh, pleasure of the board here. Move Motion approved made by Mr. Plasco, seconded by Mr. Sad. All those in favor? Aye. Chair votes aye, unanimous. Um, surplus requests, uh, similar situation, I'm assuming, for Norwood IT Department. So many requests to dispose of surplus property. Any same sentiment, Mr. Mazzucco? Yeah, we try to list everything on the website. I mean, we, we've sometimes gotten, sometimes it's 50 or 100 bucks for a piece of old office furniture or something. <laughs> we had a, um, 
Kathy always tell a story. Our old phone system we thought was junk, and we managed to get a couple hundred bucks for some really old uh, phones. So we always try to list it and get something for it at least. And this was mostly laptops, desktops, suspenders. Junk. Stuff. Junk, yeah. Okay. Uh, pleasure of the board. No motion to approve. Question to approve made by Mr. Sad, seconded by Mr. Plasco. All those in favor? Aye. Chair votes aye. Oh, on the motion, Mr. Donnelly. No, I said aye. Oh, you said I saw it. I thought you wanted to grab some of those computers. Oh, um, thank you. Great. So that brings us uh, to memoranda. Uh, pleasure of the board. I make a motion to um, accept the memoranda as submitted. Motion to accept memoranda as submitted, made by Mr. Donnelly, seconded by Ms. Grow. All those in favor? Aye. aye. Chair votes aye, unanimous. Uh, Mr. Manager. Two items for the board. Um, Thursday, May 25th from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the Senior Center, the uh, Carrie McCarthy would like to invite everyone to attend their Memorial Day exhibit. Uh, it honors all those who have served our country. There's a special presentation by Lady J. She will be impersonating Deborah Sampson, a revolutionary soldier, at 10.45 a.m. So this is a recurring program that they uh, specifically wanted to invite the board and let the public know to attend at the Senior Center if you can. Could you repeat the time again? Sure, it is uh, Thursday, May 25th. 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. with a special uh, um, show at 10.45 a.m. Uh, June 13th is the groundbreaking for the new middle school. And the board has been invited and we would like to see you there. Great. Anything further? Uh, manager? One last thing, sorry. Um, probably at your next uh, meeting we may want to discuss the middle school properties. We did um, two, pro two properties we purchased in front of the middle school. We've received back the um, lead asbestos test, so now we would be able to go forward with a um, an RFP to demo those properties if that's the direction the board wants to go in. Okay, so I have that on the agenda for the next meeting. Great. Anything else? That's it. Thank you so much. Um, Selectman's agenda, Mr. Sad. Uh, just one. I want to thank the entire school committee and their people and the people that volunteered for the honors banquet last week at the Sheridan. The uh, four points. A fantastic uh, event a lot of bright kids and know it going to some bright colleges so I want to thank all of them uh, dr. Thompson and Quigley and all the different people that were involved with that great principal etc good job Excellent. anything further no thank you mr. Sam. Ms. Grove. I only have one item of awareness for the board nothing to take action on tonight uh, but the town meeting member size committee uh, is approaching the point at which they'll be ready to deliver a report to the board um, so we'll be coordinating soon uh, they're in the final stages of the draft of the report um, but we'll be coordinating soon on an appropriate meeting for them to make that presentation great it'd be great to have uh, some members of the committee here to mm -hmm. present. Um, anything else? And that's it for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Plasco. Well, the manager took my first one. That was Washington <laughs> Street Properties. And number two is I'd like to suggest, and I know there's been discussion already, but I'll just bring it up publicly. Um, I'd like to make sure that we have a meeting, specifically the light department, to update us on all the things that are happening down there that we should be well aware of uh, and or participating in, and that it be a, a separate meeting. Um, so that we can concentrate on it and um, probably at the light department, but the venue is as important as the focus and hopefully we could have that set sometime in June. Agreed, yeah, I think that's a good idea and it'd be good to have Mr. Sad as his first meeting as a light commissioner too. So we get, get up to date on a lot of that? Yeah, thank you. Um, the other issue I'm a little, is this street paving list been posted? It's on the website. I'm upset about that. Um, Mr. Ryan mentioned that at the annual town meeting that would be posted soon. And I just assumed that we would see it first before it got posted. We made a pretty big deal about how we handle this and the board's participation and the board seeing it and approving it before it's finalized. And all of a sudden this year they just choose not to do that? I don't know if that's the case. We may have brought it to the board in the fall before Capital Outlay with the road. That long ago that we forget that we saw it? It's possible. It's that long ago that I forget that I forget if we saw it. Mm -hmm. um, I will look into that for you, though. Yeah, but because I had a, an email from somebody today, and it mentioned seeing the list online, and, I said, and we haven't even seen it. And we may have questions on it. Um, I think you can, I, Mr. Ryan, or maybe you can correct me that... Uh, well, we typically, if we posted it, would want to stay to it. 
we really actually bid by the yard, the tonnage, and so forth. So it was really dramatic need to. You could switch one street for another. Sure, and candidly, we, we always release the road list with the caution that this is the plan. There are a lot of things that will change it. Sometimes there's local work going on in an area. Sometimes you find out that there's gas or water work that needs to get done, and for some reason one road can't get done and it gets shifted a year. So it's always the plan, but sure, there's the ability to make the, the ability to make flex decisions is there all the way through really until we're done with the allocation for the year. And when we have people like me and Mrs. Donahue who want to go look at that list, I read in this email that uh, they looked at the off the town's website, but then I couldn't find it. I, I, can, only, I can only find last year's, not this year's. I will make sure that we have it. I will double check that we have it on there. I've been told we have, and I will make sure the board and gets it. Make it use a simple. <laughs> yeah, I'm thank thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just now and found the 2022 one. Uh, on a personal note, you have a new doctor in the family. I do. Although she couldn't help me with any medical problems. She, uh, my daughter, uh, Trisha, did receive her doctorate degree in education this past weekend. Congratulations. Thank you. We're proud of her. Mr. Donnelly. Uh, just two things. Um, first of all, I did attend for a couple of hours um, the Norwood Park Walk, um, which was the entire event was moved to the Space Center on Saturday. It was a very good event. It looked like it had a great turnout, a lot of opportunities for local artists to um, display their, their um, artwork and so forth. I, we, had, we were hosting friends from out of state this weekend, and they uh, joined us and had a great time at the Space Center. And so I want to list the graduate, and just um, say congratulations to those folks who, who put that event together, uh, particularly Mary Paz, uh, for all her work she did on that. And uh, hopefully that, uh, that's an event that we'll see return to Norwood in the future. Uh, I also want to mention that on June 7th at 7.30 p.m. at the Senior Center, this will be the first um, public engagement meeting for the Stormwater Utility Committee. Um, so those folks who have interest in uh, learning more about the stormwater system infrastructure and uh, um, you know, improvements to it and so forth, how we, we need to go about doing that work, it will be a good opportunity for folks to attend uh, that meeting. There will be other meetings uh, in the future uh, in regards to the uh, Stormwater Utility Committee work, uh, culminating hopefully in the fall with a more specific recommendation to town meeting in terms of how we go forward um, with the infrastructure work needed on our stormwater system. So thank you. Great. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Thank you for your work there too. Um, and I'll just add, uh, just I'll go through the Memorial Day weekend schedule for anyone that's uh, not aware. On Saturday, the 27th at 8 a.m., the flags on Veterans Graves Highland Cemetery. Cemetery. Um, and, and then on Monday, the 29th, on Memorial Day, at 8 a.m., a memori memorial mass at St. Catherine's Church. At 9 a.m., uh, lowering of the American flag to half staff at Norwood Town Hall. At 9.30 a.m., parade groups uh, will muster the Old Parish Cemetery. At 10 a.m., the parade steps off Howard Street and Washington Street, the route of March, Washington Street to Winter Street to Highland Cemetery. And at 11 a.m., ceremonies and observances uh, at Highland Cemetery. So we are invited to support, and if you are uh, available to make it, uh, it's, it's a nice event. So, and thank you to uh, Mr. Mulville for, for putting all that together. Uh, I have nothing further. Uh, motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn made by Mr. Donnelly. Second. Seconded by Ms. Grow. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Chair votes aye unanimous. Thank you and good night.